God, it has been told to us since the very beginning that you truly, you are truly the Lord of all that is and ever shall be. You are the God of both the prince and the pauper, of feast and famine, of the mighty and the weak. And yet, you do not favor the strong over the powerless. Remind us of your love as we read the scriptures, O God of justice. Open our eyes, open our hearts, that we may be strengthened and renewed by your word. Amen. Our gospel lesson is from the 12th chapter of John, and we are looking at verses 20 to 33. Hear these words. Now among those who went out to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come from you for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all my people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. On a small charter plane flying across the country sat a devout clergy person, a hippie drifter, and the smartest man on earth. They all were enjoying each other's company when the pilot and co-pilot suddenly ran out of the cockpit yelling that the plane was going down. As they opened the hatch and jumped, jumped the pilot called out, there are parachutes under your seats, bail out. Left alone in the doomed aircraft, the three grabbed the parachutes, but one was damaged. The smartest man on earth said, the world cannot be left without the knowledge I can bring. He grabbed one of the good parachutes, quickly put it on, and jumped out of the plane. The clergyman looked at the drifter and said, you take the last parachute, my son. I've always loved and served the Lord, and I know where I will be after this plane crashes. The drifter looked at the clergyman and said, Thanks, man. But you don't have to die for me. The smartest man on earth just took my backpack. <laughs> Upon hearing the parable of the wheat, Jesus tells the boys just a single grain of wheat. After its death, will bear much fruit. All along, Jesus has been telling us that he knows what is coming. He knows what he is going to face, to endure, so the world can truly live. Closer and closer to the cross he goes. What Jesus won't do for us, the sacrifice is too great for our minds, to wrap around fully. One of the key sentences in our text this morning is a simple yet important request of the Greeks. We want to see Jesus. What John is very clear about in this request, Jesus immediately 
looks to the cross for the answer. Because upon hearing this request, or excuse me, the hour he speaks about, the glory he prays for, the fulfillment of his mission, and destiny that he anticipates, all of it resolves around the cross. His obedient embrace of sacrificial love to the point of death. Every year in Alaska, a 1,000-mile dog sled race, run for prize money and prestige, commemorates the original race, the run to save lives. In January of 1926, six-year-old Richard Stanley showed symptoms of diphtheria, signaling the possibility of an outbreak in the small town of Nome. When the boy passed away a day later, Dr. Curtis Welch began immunizing children and adults with an experimental but effective anti-diphtheria serum. But it wasn't long before Dr. Welch's supply ran out. And the nearest serum was in Nanana, Alaska, 1,000 miles of frozen wilderness away. Amazingly, a group of trappers and prospectors volunteered to cover the distance with their dog teams. Op operating in relays from trading post to trapping station and beyond, one sled started out from Nome, while another, carrying the serum, started from Nanana. Oblivious to the frostbite, fatigue, and exhaustion, the teamsters mushed rel relentlessly until, after 144 hours, minus 50 degree winds, the serum was delivered to Nome. As a result, only one other life was lost to the potential epidemic. This was called the Great Serum Race. This is part of the foundations for the famous annual Iditarod. Ultimately, though, the sacrifice of these prospectors had given an entire town the gift of life. It's one thing to talk about sacrifice in dire circumstances. Sacrifice of soldiers and police and firefighters, to name just a few, put themselves in harm's way for us on a regular basis. They risk death to save and protect and serve. There are the sacrifices people make, like the prospectors and the trappers told in this story, that are more situational about when duty calls. There are a few who most certainly will take one for the team. Then there are more subtle sacrifices, the ones that are much less obvious. The school supplies teachers buy out of their own pockets to help their students learn. Volunteers at the food pantry who not only hand out food, but get to know <coughs> the clients that come through there. Most of us, I hope, understand the idea of giving an offering of money at church. There are plates and envelopes and digital commemorations. It represents the acknowledgement of God's blessing in our lives. It represents our commitment to the ministries of this congregation, to the wider church. Offering is also a part of our worship. It's a way in which we open up the windows of heaven so that God can bless us even further. It represents for many an antidote to materialism. While a few could use some encouragement, most of us understand what it means to make an offering to church. But all of us, without exception, need some help with the idea of offering ourselves to God. To truly put our whole selves in. We can't put ourselves in those offering envelopes, now can we? We can't climb to the plate when the usher comes by and says, my offering to God today is myself. Now I'm going to see if anyone of you tries this in a few moments. Most people do not come into a worship service prepared to give our whole selves over to God. We brought sins that need to be confessed and cleansed before we leave. We brought questions that need answers and problems that need solutions. 
We brought burdens that need lifted and anxieties that need to be dispelled. Frustrations and depression and boredom and preoccupation. And all kinds of distractions. May I say for that most of us, it would be easier to take out our check and double our offering and put it in a plate than it would be to turn ourselves wholly and completely over to God. But dare I say that we have not worshipped until we have given ourselves, our heart, our mind, our very souls to God. Worship is the total commitment of the total person for the total life. Real worship is not merely the offering of elaborate prayers to God. Neither is it inspiring liturgy, the inspiring sermon, right? Right? That was a joke. <laughs> it isn't necessarily making large donations, although we always greatly appreciate them. Nor is it singing majestic songs of praise. Real worship happens when we confess our sin. When we turn from that sin and then offer ourselves completely and wholeheartedly. Dare I say sacrificially to God. Would one dare not give themselves wholeheartedly when you encounter the very presence of our Creator? Would one not fall at God's feet, giving God our all? If they were literally caught up in the splendor and holiness, would one not put their whole self in if they felt the love and power of our God? The point of following Jesus is that we might be drawn more deeply into the kingdom, into the very presence of God, through our love for, service to, and sacrifice on behalf of those around us. Jesus comes to demonstrate God's strength through vulnerability, God's power through what appears weak in the eyes of the world, and God's justice through love mercy, and forgiveness. And God calls those who would follow the very same kind of life and love. Is this the Jesus that the Greeks want to see? Is this the Jesus that we want to see? I have no idea, truly, but I hope so. I do know that Jesus who reveals the heart of our loving God by going to the cross is the Jesus that we get. And the Jesus who was raised again on the third day to demonstrate that love is more powerful than hate and life, more powerful than death, is the Jesus we are called to live and love and have our being. This is the one, in the end, who has promised to draw all of us to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you in begging to be drawn closer to you. You are there all the time. Help us to look into that mirror see more clearly that you are there. Help us to live our lives so that by living the life you have blessed us with, it is itself an act of worship. Open our eyes to see you. In the name of Christ Jesus, we praise and worship you today.